Azusa Street is now just a quiet little alley near downtown Los Angeles. But a hundred years ago, this was the site of a revival unlike any seen since the events of Acts chapter 2. Starting in April 1906, dozens, then hundreds, then thousands of Christians were baptized in the Holy Ghost at this rundown ramshackle mission building. They spoke and sang in tongues, found a new depth of prayer, and saw healings and miracles. He opened another Bible school. One of his most fervent followers there was a young black pastor, William Seymour. Because of the segregation laws of the time, though, Seymour couldn't actually sit in Parham's classroom, but had to listen from out in the hallway through the door that Parham left open for him. Even though he himself had yet to speak in tongues, Seymour became an ardent advocate for Parham's doctrines as this one-eyed son of a former slave moved to Los Angeles to take a preaching job. But after just one sermon in which Seymour preached about tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, his new congregation, mightily offended, padlocked Seymour out of the church. Two black families took the cash-poor pastor into their homes till he could get enough money to return to Houston. But till then, they had him lead prayer meetings, most of them in this big house on Bonnie Bray Street. And a few days into a 10-day fast they'd held specifically seeking the Holy Ghost, he suddenly filled them. First Seymour's good friend Edward Lee when Lee was getting prayed over for healing. Wilma Berry of Joshua Ministries met us in front of the Bonnie Bray house. They came running down here to the Bible study to share with everyone the testimony. Edward Lee is filled and he was healed too, praise God. And then everyone from there was filled. Luis Johnson is a tour guide at the Bonnie Bray house. Then he started to give his testimony. And when he gave his testimony, it was happening then. It was going on. The house went wild as suddenly everyone was swept to their knees before God. And many began to speak in tongues, Seymour among them. And Seymour's future wife, Jenny Evans Moore, received another special gift that night. The Holy Ghost filled Sister Jenny Moore. And she was not a pianist. She did not know how to play the piano. But that night, when she was filled with the Holy Ghost, God also showed her how to play the piano. And she was praying, playing and singing in a language that was not her native language. Jenny received the gift of playing the piano, and she had that gift up until her death. The people in the house were so excited, they poured out onto the porch, where Seymour began to preach as an excited crowd gathered. Even the fire department was called at literal, they thought flames were coming from the top of the house. The house was filled with people, filled with the presence of the Lord. It was such an uproar that people came literally from all over the city. The house was filled for several days with masses of people jamming the yard in Bonnie Bray Street. Then just a few days before a killer quake hit San Francisco. There was a young person who came to the porch when the crowds grew out in the street and they prophesied the great San Francisco earthquake. I mean, that brought the fear, and it also brought curiosity, and they got a lot of people coming to see what was going on. People rushed the porch, the porch caved in, and they had to find a larger place. And that's when they moved to Azusa Street. The Azusa Street mission had been an abandoned church building. Apartments upstairs, dirty old stable for horses downstairs. Nothing's left now, just a short alley and a plaza where the small mission once stood. And it ran uh, 60 feet in this direction and 40 feet in that direction. In fact, Cecil Roback, the world's leading authority on Azusa and author of Azusa Street, Mission and Revival, gave us a tour of the area. And we would actually be standing inside the mission at this particular point uh, on the plaza. The services took place where the horses used to be stabled. Up to 1,500 people might try to jam into the main room with those who couldn't fit filling every window. On a hot day or night, it could be tough to breathe beneath the eight-foot ceiling. Everybody was having to fight the flies all the time. That, that you know, the horses had been in there, they had done their business, the flies were hatching out, and it was an incredibly uh, awful place to have to worship. And yet, here were hundreds and hundreds of people attracted day after day, staying many times all night long uh, in order to be where God was doing something. The presence of God was so heavy on the Azusa Street mission, people sometimes reported being knocked to the ground by it, blocks from the mission. Inside, they said the Holy Spirit himself ran the meetings, which often went non-stop around the clock, filled with healing, signs, and wonders. One of the most striking features was an impromptu singing in tongues where all the voices in the room would harmonize in what was soon dubbed the Heavenly Choir. Sometimes Seymour was hardly visible in these meetings as he'd pray for hours with his head tucked inside the higher of two boxes nailed together to serve as a pulpit. But his leadership was rarely needed as the Spirit appeared to orchestrate dozens of people testifying, singing, and preaching in each meeting. 
anybody, regardless of their age, could be six or they could be 60. Uh, it didn't matter whether they were black or white or brown or any other color. It didn't matter what their level of education was. It didn't matter what their gender was. They were understood to be a real priesthood of all believers in which every believer had something to give, something to contribute. But a main feature of Azusa was people falling before the Lord, getting baptized in the Spirit, and beginning to speak in tongues. Local newspapers like the Los Angeles Times mocked it over and over. An early headline read, Weird Babble of Tongues, New Sect of Fanatics is Breaking Loose. Critics have said that these tongues weren't really languages at all. But listen to this. Once a Jewish man went into the mission to gather evidence about tongues to use it in sermons against Christianity. When he went up a staircase in the mission, a young lady pointed a finger at him and in perfect Hebrew, his native language, told his first name, last name, what he was doing in Los Angeles, and gave him a record of all his sins. He asked where she learned Hebrew. She said she didn't know. She was speaking in tongues. He fell to his knees and repented on the spot. People would come into the meeting and they would hear their language, Russian and Armenian and various languages, and they would hear the gospel being preached, and they would come running to the altar, how do you know my language, and give their hearts to the Lord. 